Help me welcome Bishop Chuck Salvo all the way from Louisville, Kentucky. Amen. Good to see everybody tonight. I was amazed that pastor asked me to come back after the last time I was here. It's always an honor to be able to get an invitation back after you preach. Amen. Amen. And uh, just before I do get, get into what the Lord has laid on my heart for the house, um, as you leave tonight, there's a table out there with a couple of books. Uh, Three Minutes to Midnight is my latest book. Uh, and then prayer, a building block for a new man. Um, if you don't have prayer in your life, you need to get this. Prayer is the only thing that's going to keep you right. Amen? And then three minutes to midnight. We're closer than ever, but I don't want to talk on, about the books, but you can just get them if you want them. And uh, the way I work it is you just go to the table, and uh, uh, whatever you want to give them, you give them. If you don't, want to, if you don't have any money get, and you want the book, just take it. It's, it's free, but if you want, you help Somebody, we got we had to order more of these because we're going to be out of these. Sh sh it cost me like six dollars a book, and so if you want to give you know a, a little bit over that, that's great. You can help us buy some more books to give somebody else, amen. Praise God! Yeah, God's doing some great things at On Fire, God's uh, moving, God has uh, tremendously blessed us, uh, you know, with all this woke garbage that's going on and um, uh, preachers. Um, Un Pastor got into it. I don't want to preach Tommy Bates' message tomorrow. Praise, praise God. Uh, but the, the, a denomination, uh, we actually have in our first church plant, uh, a denomination that um, uh, many would know decided they're going to allow homosexuality into, you know, into their pu pulpits. And, and so there's a major split going on. Well, these people that were running this church uh, about 30 miles from us would come over to our church on Sunday night. And they've been doing that for about three years. And uh, they came up to me and they said, Pastor Salvo, we'd like you to, uh, we're, we're breaking free from this denomination and we'd like you to take the church. And I said, well, no thank you. I got, I got one, I'm good. And uh, she came back again and said, Pastor Salvo, we really think you're supposed to take the church. And I said, I, I said no thank you. And she came back a third time. And... Um, I, and I just threw this out there because I didn't think she was going to do it. I said, well, I'll tell you what, I don't, I, I'll, I'll consider it. I, I won't even look at it because I won't even bother wasting my time looking into it. But I said, I'll consider it if you, if you just hand the whole church over to our, to our, to our, to our church. In other words, because I don't want to deal with boards, man. I don't want to deal with their board of directors, so all demon-possessed deacons. And I got, you know, I'm not into that. I, I just, I ain't got time for that. I, I, I don't need a vote because we're going to change the color of the, uh, of the carpeting, and I'm not into that. And I said, if you hand it all over, I'll consider it. They came back, and they said, well, we're going to take a vote, but temper of the vote looks like it's unanimous. And I said, well, all right, let's look at the church. Well, it turns out it's a church, of about a $550,000 church uh, building, amen, debt-free. And... Uh, they, uh, and then they said, well, and I said, well, that's awesome. I said, and I looked at the church. I was like, ooh, it's going to need some renovation in here. We're going to make it a little on fire Christian church. And so it turns out they, they handed over a checking account that came along with the church with $60,000 in it. I said, well, you're helping me make up my mind. Amen. And so we went in, and within two days, we had $60,000 spent. <laughs> the, the members that were there, you know, obviously, there was, they, they only had 14 left because everybody else left. Church seats about 120 people, and they had full cafeteria and beautiful facility. And so we renovated it ready, and we're going to be having our, our first service December the 9th, a Friday night out there, and, and, and it's called Big Spring, Kentucky. And so my deacon, or my elder, uh, is actually one that's going to be our campus pastor out there. And we're just so blessed that God's, God's done that for us, and we're just so grateful. Amen. Well, let's go ahead and get into the Word, shall we? Are y'all ready? Say we love you. You know, I, I really wish I could be an encourager like your pastor. He is the, he's got to be the greatest encourager I know. I just listen to him talk and I smile. That's no joke. I really think he's the best. I'm not just saying that. I said, when he comes to my church, I was like, you're the best preacher there is. I don't know. I really don't know much about, better preacher than him. He just, and then he gets to singing. My God, the anointing. I get chills every time he goes to singing. Glory to God. Amen. 
I sure, I sure pray you appreciate your pastor and his wife. Come on, let's say it. Give me God bless you. 30 years. My God. You don't look that old. When Brother Nathan was talking, I said, well, we're going to get the walking chair out if he keeps going. <laughs> How many people remember cassette tapes? I was thinking about that years ago because I, 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 I had a music ministry when I first started, and I had all my, my stuff made on cassette tapes. We were pulling out the old stuff from there. I have, I have three containers, about 1,500 cassette tapes still. I can't even give them away. Nobody wants cassette tapes anymore. Oh, my gosh. All right. Well, let's see what the Lord's going to do tonight. I'm, I'm really excited. Title of my message tonight is Enemy Banners Destroyed. Yep, that's it. Go on ahead. Stand up on your feet. Your pastor, I just so appreciate the fact that he's trained you all so wonderfully well. Enemy banners destroyed. I'm looking in Zechariah, the 13th chapter, in verse 1, and here's what it says. In that day a fountain shall be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem, for sin and for uncleanness. And it shall be in that day, says the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols from the land, and they shall no longer be remembered. I will also cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to depart from the land. Father, anoint your word tonight with great power and authority. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. Confirm your word tonight, Lord, with signs and wonders following. And everybody say a great big amen. 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 You may be seated tonight. A banner. Enemy banners destroyed. A banner is a piece of cloth attached to a staff and used as a standard by a monarch, a military commander, or a knight. The flag of a nation, a state, on army. When I say in the title of the message tonight, and we'll get to it in a minute, enemy banners destroyed, the enemy has lifted up his banner in the last days. He has banners uplifted in churches from the north, the south, the east, and the west. It should begin to sicken you and I and cause such a righteous indignation to get on the inside of believers to spur them on to righteous acts. It ought not be the remnant, which it usually always is. A small remnant is the one usually pulling the weight in most churches today. The brother pr previously mentioned that the average pastor, pastors a congregation for four to five years. And so it is a big ac accomplishment because most people don't realize the warfare that pastors, your pastor, has had to endure. He might come out here with a smile on his face and singing, and the glory of God comes down, the anointing gets underneath him and lifts him up. But my God, you have no idea, many have no idea, the payment that it has cost him and his wife to walk in such an anointing. I love Bible school students. To be, we just started a, a cohort with our pastor, Pastor Parsley, at, at, at our church, and, and, and you, you go to Bible colleges, and you, you hear these young, you know, people with dreams, and rightly so, people that have dreams, we thank God for it, and they got the, oh, I'm going to preach to the nations, and you know, when you're, in the, when you're in the kingdom of two, three, four years, you're like, amen, oh, amen, and when you're 30 years, you're like, well, praise the Lord, amen. Because you know that when they're coming out of their mouth one minute, but then, you know, two months later, the little girl shows up, batting her eyelashes, and the next thing you know, he falls into sin with her. What happened to your holiness? What happened to your pursuit? I want you to know when God calls you, God's going to call you, but then he has to equip you. And if God's going to equip you, you must be holy, my friend. I'm sick and tired of this lax, laid-back Christianity that we have in our culture today. And people are coming to our Pentecostal churches thinking that we're like them. I ain't like you. You want to talk about sipping saints. 
Oh, I'm talking about, I'm sick of these preachers. I had a preacher sit down at a meal with me once, and I had no idea, and we were talking, and I was going to help him. He was going through some hard times, and he was telling me how he would get under stress, and he had to have, you know, I just have a little sip of wine. They take the edge off, and boy, I don't know if he thought I was going to give him a pat on the back, but I gave him a stern rebuke in Jesus. I said, my God in heaven, we've been told to lean on the king of glory, not on Jack Daniels, Mogan David, whatever other David. I've been called to lean on God. Can I get somebody to say amen in here? We got, well, right, right now, I love Donnie McClurkin came out, just saw the video, came out and threw Motown and, and, and all these gospel singers under the bus as he came out just recently and said, oh yeah, they're having their little gospel dove awards and then backstage they got nothing but secular music and an open bar to Christian events. My friend, some preachers better start rising up and rebuking this demonic spirit that's in the culture. We got too many preachers wanting to get pat on the back, wanting to get everybody to like them. I ain't here to like nobody and nobody like me. I've been with the king of glory and I got a message and I came to give a message today and I'm here to slap that devil in every banner that he tries to raise up. I've been here to slap the devil upside his head. The Lord said, it shall come in that day that I will cut off the names of idols, and they will no longer be remembered, and I will also cause the prophets. Now, in that context, he's not talking to righteous prophets. He's talking about a false doctrine, false prophets and the unclean spirit to depart. I don't care if preachers wear skinny jeans. I don't care if they got their hair all moosed up and they got hair. I'd be applauding them. Just the fact that they have hair, they're well, well past me. But I don't care about that. What are they preaching? What are they, pre- are they preaching against sin? Is it, are they life coaches or are they preachers? We don't need life coaches. We need preachers. I go in my church, I can't tell you how many times I've walked up to somebody that kept coming over and over and over, and they're like this in church. <sighs> Praise the Lord. Praise. And I, I, You know, when it turns your stomach as a preacher, that's the Lord telling you it's time to open your mouth. So I came back. As she walked in there having praise and worship, hey, hi, Pastor Chuck. I said, listen, my, and, and, and my, Smiley, you weren't with me then, were you? I don't think you were there, back then. And I looked at her and I said, now listen here. I said, I love you, and I want you to make it right, and I want you to make it to heaven. But you're having sex with your boyfriend. And it's better stop, or you'll go to hell. You know what she said to me? Pastor, no, I'm not. I said, yes, you are. She said, no, I'm not, Pastor. I swear to God. I said, don't say that. You know you are. You're having sex, and you're in trouble with God. You said, what happened? Well, she kept lying to me, and she kept lying. She lied all her way out. To, I, I wish I could give you a big story that she fell on her face before God. She didn't fall on her face before God. No, she didn't. She, got imp- she was pregnant, and then she got pregnant, and then her whole life's now a major mess. But see, but see we, need, we need the prophetic again in the house of God. And you, got, you better start, you're going to start living in sin, and then you come in here, and you think everything's okay. There's an age coming. We people, I'm telling you, they're going to start dropping. There's coming a move of God. They're going to start dropping. They're going to start. You come in here thinking you can touch your girlfriend's breasts and you're going to get away with it. My God, no. God's sick and tired of this playing church stuff. I'm tired of these young people. Ain't got no prayer life and they want to prophesy and they want to get on the keyboard and play. And they, Oh, I got a gift. I got a gift. We just had one big time guy. I love the music that this group puts out. And this one guy, they sat him down while he comes off of some party bus, singing secular, and they got him on video coming off of some party bus. What the heck is wrong with people? What the heck is wrong? Where the, and then you talk about it, my God, you're judging me. Let me tell, can we talk about homosexuality? Because I like doing that. You want to know why? Because Christians don't know how to handle it. If you got a penis, you're a male. You were born a male, God made you a male. 
God expects you to act like a male. If you don't act like a male and you feel like a female, let me tell you what you're supposed to do. You get yourself to an altar. You call on a man of God and say, get this devil off of me. But we got preachers playing to this garbage. We got church people. Oh, well, they were born that way. They weren't born that way, you idiot. We slap God in the face. When, that's called idolatry. The adversary has lifted up a banner in church, walking around declaring homosexuality is an alternative life. Um, oh, abortion. We ought to be in righteous indignation. The same Jesus that flipped tables over is the same Jesus that comes in the sanctuary and we sing the hallelujah chorus. He's full of love and he's full of righteousness. And one day, full of justice, my friend. There's a day of coming. And every woman, every boy, every girl will stand before Almighty God. Well, what's our job? What's 30 years at redemption for? We're called to lift up the moral standard. That's why we're here. We're here to lift the moral standard. We're not going to bow. We don't bow to a culture. I'm not intimidated by their stupid, their woke crap. And this, and this racist crap. And I, you know what? It is. Oh my God, the preacher said it. What am I going to do? Because it is. You know, I got a, I, I have a, I have a, I have a pre predominantly mixed church just like you do. You want to know, and you know what? My people know better. Are you hearing me? When this BLM garbage start coming out, I got behind it. I, I got behind my people and I said, don't get a part of that crap. You want to know why? Wrong spirit. Wrong spirit. I had people wanting them to stand up. George Floyd, I said, don't get behind it. It ain't right. It ain't right. Jesus looked at the sons of thunder and said, now listen, what you want to do, I understand what you want to do, but you ain't got the right spirit. Somebody's got to have some discernment. You know what? Instead, we got preachers don't have any discernment, and they're getting behind this junk, this woke junk, and it's spreading racism. Because nobody wants to call it out. I don't care if you think I'm white. I'm black on the inside. I'm white, I'm black, I'm red, I'm yellow. I love Jesus. We got to throw our stinking color at the altar. Come on, somebody kick that banner over. Devil trying to lift up his banners in the church, in the heart of God's people. And they don't know how to deal with it. You get around other people and you don't know what to do. You stand up for righteousness. Do you know in Zechariah when... The Lord said, I'll cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to depart. Well, it's not going to come from the message they're preaching today. It's going to come by the anointing. You know, the message in Zechariah wasn't to the heathen. He's preaching to the church. I don't know if you realize this, but this book is not to heathens. It's to the church. The message is to be believers people that were supposed to be walking after God and we got a message that God's given us but the adversary is trying to raise up in the heart of his people God's people and it happens to all of us from time to time with well, the next thing you know we're making alliances or agreements with demonic thoughts or ways and we need the spirit of God to breathe on us Jesus said in John 15, apart from me, you can do nothing. If you have no prayer life, you have no, you have no ability to stay in the spirit. And so you're carnal. You're living on this earth as a believer, carnal. The sins of God people, God's people are idolatry and believing in false prophecy. A lying spirit believes, when you believe a lying spirit, it brings into idolatry right into your culture, right into your life, right into your marriage. Agreement with anything but truth brings idolatry, which in turn gives access to an unclean spirit. And the devil brings in his subtle lies that can bring destruction. Like, God's mad at me. If you, you say, well, God's mad at me. Okay, the devil 
has his banners lifted in churches all over because people believe that lie. In church, God's mad at me. Well, do, did you believe on the gospel? Did you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you given your heart to the Lord? And when you don't believe the truth of God's word, a banner is lifted. So here you are coming to church and the devil is waving a banner over you in the midst of the congregation. And he's letting every devil in that area and mocking God because that's what the devil does. He mocks out through homosexuality. He does this through people that are pro-abortion. They're, they're mocking God, right? And so we've got people that we love God, but when we believe lies that the devil has dropped in us and we believe those lies and we don't even have discernment to know the difference, then what happens is, is a banner gets lifted up and then you walk under condemnation. And the word says there's no condemnation to them that are in Christ. And so why are, why are we believing? Do you know it takes faith to be saved and it takes faith to walk it out? I walk it out today. I walk out the fact that I'm forgiven by the mere grace of God, that God does love me, that God does have a wonderful plan for my life. And no matter how much I screw up, God is, God's mercy is there. But I don't use that mercy as a license to go out and live in iniquity. Amen? Here's one. How about, how about this agreement that we many come in contact with and then it brings idolatry is my marriage won't last or we need to get a divorce. And these thoughts penetrate our being in church and then we go through 50% of Christian marriages, the last I checked, has go, it, it ends, it ends in divorce. So, so here we have people that are Pentecostal people supposedly with the power of the anointing and yet they're going through a divorce. Now, I, don't get me wrong. I've been married, this, this year was 35 years for my wife and I. Amen. And my wife, by the way, couldn't be with us. That we were gonna, She was going to be here. And just last, she, she's the principal of our school. And so it's just, it's just real crazy. So she just couldn't get away. I tried to get her, but she couldn't get her. And uh, uh, 30, 35 years. And, and, and it's not always a bed of roses. It's tough. You know it's tough being a Christian. You know it's tough, but it's like, my God, I've been saved. I've been saved for 35 years. I got saved just, just before. I met my wife first, and then we got saved together two months later. Amen. After we got married, we got, we got saved two months later. Glory to God. And, and so, and it's been a wonderful ride. Amen. Um, idolatry is the worship of a physical object as, as a God. Uh, and when you, you believe lies like, my marriage won't last, or my spouse doesn't love me, or I'm unworthy of being loved. Those are deceiving lies that the adversary wants to put in your life, and then he can lift a banner and say, look, at how, look how I've destroyed another marriage. And so we got people, now don't be under condemnation. I got a church full of people that have been married and divorced. And what, I, what do I tell them? I, here's the, my counsel. Stay married to the one you got. Amen? Stay married. The grace of God is there, but don't be stupid again. Amen. I had one woman come to me and she was married four times and, and she got talked to me. She said, well, I've been married four times, but it was always the man's fault. What, you said, what did I do? I was a good pastor. I kept my mouth shut. If she didn't learn after four times that she had some responsibility for that, she's stupid. And what's stupid mean? Unable to accept truth. So let's just get her to heaven and amen. Let's just preach to you. Get, get her to heaven. We lift up banners in our, in our churches. God won't heal me. I'm sick because, I, because I've sinned. I, I've sinned and so God won't heal my body. Uh, God won't provide for me. And so, so we're, we, 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 we think these thoughts and we get into agreement with these deceiving lies and then we make an idol out of this deception. An idol is something that you bow to. And people, what, you ready? You ready? People, see, I, I do this to my own people. I'm going to do it to you. I'm leaving t right after we're done. And so, and, and so every Sunday... You're being tested to whether or not you're going to bow the knee to an idol. Now, I'm going to hit probably only, because this is a real sanctified church, only a handful of you. But when you don't pay your tithes, you are bowing, watch this, to a demon. 
I don't care what Creflo said. I don't care. I'm telling you that I've been in this, and that's not because I'm a pastor. Uh, it's I firmly believe in tithing, and the, it is totally pre-law. In the garden, all these trees don't eat, but don't touch that one. That, my friend, is a tithe. Come on. That all through the word, you see where God sets something apart. On the days of, uh, he told the children of Israel, go out six days, collect manna. But don't collect manna on this day. you will have enough for two days. So, so what God's telling you is don't touch that tithe. And if you won't, you're telling me you believe my covenant promises. And so, see, I lost some of you. So you just told on yourself because I can feel it in the spirit realm. But that's okay. I'm here to ruffle somebody because I'm tired of the enemy doing this over your head. Now, see, you don't see it. But when you walk in and you walk in defeat and you, you can't, you ain't, listen, you ought to have more than enough. And you want to know why God wants you to have more than enough? So that you're able to give on every occasion. Why? So that when you see somebody in poverty, you're able to reach out a hand and tell them about the covenant promises that God gave you. Unclean spirits jump on the back of any lie we believe and strengthen the lie within even, within even to our emotions. So then our emotions are then entangled in the lie. And that's dangerous because if you're, if you're a person that doesn't have a daily committed prayer life, whew, you, you really, you're going to need to get into an atmosphere of anointing and and, and the anointing is going to break that thing because you're not getting into the presence of God on your own to get into an anointing to break that thing. So then you got to come underneath someone else who's paid the price so that the anointing can bring deliverance because you're not in prayer. Most Christians don't pray every day. And if they do, they got a little 10 minute prayer. You know, the average preacher, they say, prays minutes on the day. Uh, it's, it's quite sad. That's why they're not anointed. And that's why they're life coaches. And so. Um, unclean spirits like this. Unclean spirits are operating in churches um, such as, and I'm sure you've dealt with this in 30 years. Obviously, everything I'm saying, he's dealt with it. Because when you've been around this long, you, you deal with it. Is You deal with envy. You deal with jealousy. You deal with uh, people talking on each other. You deal with apathy. You deal with people complacent. You, people, you deal with people that have lost their fire. You, and it breaks your heart as a pastor because you see them so excited about God and then they, then they begin to kind of trickle off. You know, I see people, one time they were coming all service. I'm a, I'm a big time preacher on go to church every time the doors are open. Um, I, preach, I, I, I preach to my people, go to church on Sunday morning. We go on Sunday night. We go on Wednesday night. We got prayer uh, uh, on Thursday night. And, and, and I just, I, I've always been that way. Not because I'm a preacher because that's what I've done since the day I got saved. And I, I think you were supposed to repent and do the first work, so I'm just not going to stop doing the first works. Not that you're saved by what you do, but boy, oh boy, he saved me. I don't own anything, and I just want to repay him. And I don't, I, the, all through the scriptures, the prophets all declared, don't be deceived in the last days. Are you hearing me? And so there's a great deception that's hit the body to think they're okay when they're not okay. They're not okay. Um, so I want, let's turn real, real quick now to Psalm 74. Psalm 74, and this is powerful. God wants to destroy these banners that have been lifted in, in his church. Um, I, I, I came out to, of service, it was last week, and I was preaching, and I never saw this couple, and they were all the way in the last row. And I don't know, they might, Smiley, they might have been in their mid-40s maybe. And they're all over each other. Now I'm preaching. Now I want to be nice because they're visitors, right? I'm like, what in the world they come here for? I mean, this isn't a drive-in theater, you know? And, I'm, and while I'm preaching, I'm getting ticked. Now, and, and I can just feel it. Usually, I'm, usually I don't pay attention. Like when I'm preaching, you know, I could have my wife sitting on the front row of the whole service and then say, honey, where were you? I didn't see you. Because you, you kind of like just get lost in, in when you're ministering. And, but I could feel the, the, the devil, a banner, mocking God. So I stopped the whole service. Now, 
what I wanted to do was I wanted to call them out. I want to, I want to get over here. Come on down here. I'm going to cast the devil out of you. That was my flesh. And so I said, come on, church. We're going to begin praying. And here's how I knew it was the Spirit because I, we start praying and praying. I was binding and loosening and k- kicking devils out and this and that. And uh, I started praying. It was about five minutes later. And, I, and they paid attention the whole service. And amazingly, they were back last night and uh, didn't notice they were all over each other. And I pray it stays that way. Amen. And uh, as we get to know them, we can help them grow more and more as long as there's etiquette to God's house. Amen. You come into God's house, you're not going to be handling your girlfriend. Amen. Praise God. And I knew they weren't married because married people don't do that. (laughs) Not in public anyways. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Pastor. Look at this, Psalm 74. This is powerful. You know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and turn there to Psalm 74. Look what this says, Psalm 74. I'm looking in verse, uh, verse 2. Remember your congregation which you have purchased of old, the tribe of your inheritance which, which you have redeemed. The Mount, this Mount Zion where you have dwelt, lift up your feet to the perpetual desolations. The enemy has damaged everything in the sanctuary. Your enemies roar in the midst of your meeting place. They set up their banners for signs. They seem like men who lift up axes among the thick trees. This psalmist is getting really ticked. What's he saying? First and foremost, he says this. He says, remember your congregation which you have purchased of old. Remember your church that you purchased with your blood. This house, we can never forget, has been purchased by the blood of Jesus. It cost him his precious blood that you and I can stand here today, redeemed by the crimson red blood of Jesus. And I want you to know today, those that are in this house, that God loves you so much, and he doesn't want any area, not one area of our lives, defeated where the enemy has a right to lift up a, up a flag. Whether that's in your marriage, because let's just face it, I, I counsel with married couples all the time in, in our church. And, and when I say all the time, it's usually right after a service, this and this. And then I say, and, and, and then I only give them more time if they're coming to church. Uh, you know, I, say, Pastor, what's your counsel? Well, come to church Sunday morning, come to church Sunday night, and come to church Wednesday night. I never counsel people that show up once a week. Because no, my counsel is, well, can you be here Sunday night? Well, yeah. Can you be here? Now, if they're working, they, that's a different story. But I, I'm not going to waste my time with you because my counsel session is Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. That's where you're going to get. What you, the, when the anointings, everything else comes out of counsel, out of the brain. That's not going to help you. The anointing's going to help you. You know, I found something out about marriage counseling. Usually it's just he did this, she did this, and that's all it is. It's what he and she did. Nobody wants to repent. When I was counseling this couple yesterday, at one time I got up and I was, I, I just, you, you wouldn't want me to be your pastor. I, I said, you know what? I'm done. I said, you are all the most selfish, self-centered people right now. Do you understand that? I said that, and I looked at the woman, I said, the devil is speaking through you. I'm not saying I'm a good pastor. I just tell you what I do. I'm not saying it. Remember your congregation which you have purchased of old. The tribe of your inheritance which you have redeemed. This Mount Zion where you have dwelt. Watch Watch what the psalmist says. Lift up your feet. What does it mean? Lift up your feet and please come to our aid. I've been prophesying this for a decade. We are on the prefaces of the greatest outpouring that the world has ever seen. And God is going to throw these false prophets out the door and true men of God are about to rise up and proclaim, thus says the Lord. Lift up your feet to what? To the perpetual desolations. That is those ruins of the city and country which have lasted so long. Individuals that have been bound year after year after year after year. I got news for you. The devil is about ready to get an eviction notice. I'm telling you because God is sick and tired of the banner that the adversary has lifted over you. You might have had depression over your life for 20 years 
and you're sick and tired of popping Prozac and Zoloft. Well, I want you to know there's somebody you can pop today. You pop the name Jesus, and when the anointing's in the house, and your faith grabs onto that anointing, it breaks every yoke of bondage, and the banner of the adversary is slain. Come on, somebody say amen. Perpetual desolations. The enemy, the enemy has damaged everything in the sanctuary. When it shouldn't just be the pastor who grieves when there's thickness in the atmosphere and he leaves the service because of a thickness in the atmosphere. We'd like to admit that it's always up, and even when it's up, the pastor knows when it's not. The pastor knows when, you know what, we usually run at a level eight in flow, and right now we're at a level two, and everybody's, eh, and you can tell it just ain't right. And the pastor goes home, and he cries out to God. He wakes up the next morning as demons are beating his brain and telling him it's his fault and all this, and he's got to wake up and get plowing again because that's what preachers do. They never quit, unlike some of you. See, you know, you can stay out of church for two and three weeks because you got a little wedgie because somebody didn't talk to you right. God's looking for somebody that can be rebuked and somebody that nobody ever talked to you right or treated you right and you still are at your post. You never move. My friend, what you just said when you still stood your ground and didn't move from your post is you told God, I'm ready for any assignment you got for me. The moment you tuck tail and run, you just became unworthy of God's advancement. God's looking for individuals that know how to stick with it and not give up so quickly. The enemy has damaged everything in the sanctuary. It ought to make us weep. We ought to be, be, we ought to be crying out to God in, in, for revival. Revivals don't come through services. They come through prayer meetings. Revivals don't come through you and I gathering together listening to a preacher. Revivals come when you and I, the Bible says in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, and I'm sure you're well aware of it. If my people, who, my people, not other people, my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. That means you stop drinking. I, I tell my leaders, if you're going to drink, resign now because I never want to hear that you, got, you went to the store and you got some bear. One guy told me that he got himself some bear because he, got, he had to get some because he cooks with it. I said, well, you ain't cooking with it and you can sit down for a while because that's a hogwash garbage. You said, what happened? He ain't around no more because I called him out. He's a liar. Liar. You don't sip because you like it. You sip because you want to fit in. You want people to like you. I got me a promise from God, Pastor Todd. You know what it is? Jesus on the, oh my God. He sat at the, at, at the Last Supper and he lifted up a cup. This is the cup of the fruit of the vine. And he looked at his disciples and said, I will not drink of it again until we drink it together in the kingdom of God. And I said, me too. Me too. I, ain't touch, I haven't touched a sip in 35 years. Don't want nothing. I got the most high. What do I need that stuff for? Some people go on there. I, I went one time a Methodist pa a pastor did a, ser a sermon or something, and, and we had to go to the wedding thing afterwards, and he's out there with his little mixed drink. Don't tell me you'd, you'd, you'd have respect for me right now if I had a drink in one hand and a cigarette in the other. Then if you can't respect me, how in the world do you expect your, your little kids and grandchildren to respect you? Some of you have been smoking for 30 years and you don't even want to quit. They get prim, you're not even fighting it. You just smoke and you like it. You don't care if you're doing it outside the church was. I don't care. Well, I'm not looking at pastor right now. I'm, I'm looking at you. I'm tired of seeing cigarette butts floating around my church. And I preach like this and they still do it. You say, what is that? That's called witchcraft. That's, ca that's called rebellion. That's called no respect for the atmosphere of God. No respect for the atmosphere. No respect. I can't hold back my, my, my lust while I'm in this house because I surely wouldn't want a little six-year-old seeing me smoking. Come on, somebody. I don't get, it ain't going to send you to hell, but it'll make you smell like you've been there and it destroys your witness. What's the time? It's time to get that banner off of you and start crying out to God. Get filled with the Holy Ghost. Let's see what happens to you. When was the last time you got filled with a... Well, I talk in tongues, Pastor Chuck. Okay, when was the last time you tarried in tongues? 
You cried out to God. What was the last time tears streamed down your face to get the idols that creep into our lives and don't tell me they don't. We've been lying for too long. Idolatry is affection. And when you and I have affection for anything other than the king, idolatry has crept in. We come into church and we mosey in here. Ten minutes late. What are we saying to God? Eh, I'm not interested. You know. You know God's on time. I don't know. They didn't give me, they didn't give me a time. <laughs> Let's finish this up. There's enemies roaring in church. When you don't have joy and it's beaten up with depression, an enemy has taken over and lifted a flag, a banner. Devils roaring against God's power. As we've got people coming to our churches living in sexual morality with no conviction. They set up banners. A banner is a piece of cloth attached to a staff and used as a standard by a monarch, military commander or knight. The devil does that. Demons setting up their ways within the hearts of believers. These banners strengthen the fortresses of devil strongholds. I'm reading now at Psalm 74, verse 9. We do not see our signs. There is no longer any prophet, nor is there any among us who know how long. Oh God, how long will the adversary reproach? This, is, this ought to be the cry of every believer. Will the enemy blaspheme your name forever? Why do you withdraw your hand, even your right hand? Take it out of your bosom and destroy them. For God is my king of, from of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. You divided the sea by your strength. You broke the heads of the sea, serpents in the waters. You broke the heads of Leviathan in pieces. You gave him as food to the people inhabiting the wilderness. You broke open the fountain and the flood. You dried up the mighty rivers. The day is yours. The night also is yours. You have prepared the light and the sun. You have set all the borders on the earth. You have made summer and winter. Remember this, that the enemy has reproached, O Lord, and that a foolish people has blasphemed your name. Oh, do not deliver the life of your turtle dove to the wild beast. I'm reminded of turtle dove in Song of Sol Solomon chapter 2. The flowers appeared on the earth. The time of singing has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. I believe the Lord calls you and I his thing. He loves when you and I sing and worship the created being. Are you hearing me today? Do not deliver the life of your turtle dove to the wild beast, demonic power. Do not forget the life of the poor forever. Have respect to your covenant. For the dark places of the earth are full of haunts of cruelty. Do not let the oppressed return ashamed. Let the poor and needy praise your name. And then finally, the prophet cries out in 22, verse 22. Arise, O God. Plead your own cause. Remember how the foolish man reproaches you daily. Do not forget the voice of your, of your enemies. There's a cry for God to move in revival. This church for 30 years has been a clarion call, a beacon, a lighthouse for people to come. And trust me, if your pastor's like me, and I know he is, that's why I love him so much, you can never have enough. You're never satisfied. You have an insatiable thing that drives you. If you see 1,000 saved, it's not enough. If you see 10,000 saved, it's not enough. God, come and destroy the banners that the enemy has set up in our midst. What's the greatest way that this house can move forward in such great authority and power. It's to be a banner of righteousness, to consistently be looking at our life, that our life is emulating the very character of God, that you and I do what God says, love God and love people, that when we've got an opportunity to be offended, we don't even realize we're offended. When people say things nasty to us, we don't go and talk to nobody because you don't even realize somebody's talking nasty on you because you don't care. It's totally like you're so good in yourself and how is that possible? Well, that's not possible with broken people. What has to happen is we've got to become so inebriated in the spirit of God once again. When you're inebriated, what does drunk people do? When a drunk person hurts themselves, they don't even realize they got hurt. When a drunk person says, somebody looks at what, drunk people love everybody. 
Everybody, you just love it. You, don't, I, you just met me. I love you anyways. Because that's what drunk people do. My friend, God has called you and I to be filled with his spirit. He has given us this house so that we can come and make sure the banners of righteousness are enacted and lifted high rather than allowing the adversary. But you and I can never allow the enemy to consistently be rolling in. Every single day when we go into prayer, we're summoning the king of glory. I need you to overlook my life. I need you to be in my life in such a way that the adversary cannot lift up a banner. You and I need to be the ones always walking in supreme health. And even when we're not, we've got a word in season. We've got a joy unspeakable. There's something on the inside of you that clicks. You're never down. But when you are down, you act like you're up. Why? Because I know that my joy cometh in the morning. You got to understand I got something that you don't have and I want everybody to have it. Are you hearing me today? God's looking for somebody to lift up and say, my God, I'm anointed. Somebody say, say I'm anointed. Come on, somebody say I'm anointed. You got an anointing on the inside of you to break down every banner. Are you hearing me today? God wants you and I to be that people. I don't know what banner the enemy's been lifted up on you. I don't know what, it, what banner the adversary's been lifting up. Maybe, it's, maybe the enemy just beats you up because you just think you're so unworthy. Maybe your marriage is going through hell. Maybe it's addiction. I've been dealing with for the last five years with uh, men with addiction. We have a, a program called Abba's House. And, uh, and, and what, a, what a devil. And it just, it, 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 it destroys. I'm not trying to, I, 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 don't, I, I don't justify their behavior. They're going to stand before God because God gave them a choice. For instance, if that's you in this place, there's no reason to leave bound but what, you come and you get delivered. But it is, a, a humility has to come. The only reason people don't get set free is they didn't lay it all on the altar. Like, for instance, I want to come and I, I want to get rid of my addiction, but I'm going to go home and I'm going to sleep with my girlfriend. See, that you, you're not going to get delivered. And even if you do, it'll be temporary. See, what you do is you realize in this atmosphere that he's holy, you're not. I need to learn the ways of the king. And so what you do is I come to get delivered. And then, well, I ain't got a place to go. And I've been shacked up with this girl. That's not my wife. Well, I guess I'm going to stay home with mom and dad. Well, I, I, call pastor up. He'll let you come stay at his house. <laughs> that was a joke. He, he won't. Don't ask him. Can I get the instrumentals? Come on over here. I think it's time to go. Wanna be so wonderful.